reviews by Phelps and Love of South and Think It's L. Uh, this podcast on these Craig Trans and different business friends in the middle of South Florida. And today's date, Wednesday, November 7th, 2018. So let us begin. All right. Thanks for calling, my friends. Checking in to be exact. A mustache, 109 Southwest 2nd Avenue in the heart of the Hemisphere District of Fort Lauderdale. Adjacent with Revolution Live and uh, America's Backyard. Well, so the elections is over. It looks like Bill Nelson wants to do a recount. How glamorous. The man who supports a police state platform. We should all hold hands when he walks, sit, walks by and sing God Bless the Patriot Act, right? Yeah, he voted for that. He voted for other bills that were considered unconstitutional. Even though Rick Scott may have won, but I said that's still Bill Nelson's tyrannical twin brother. But one thing I gotta say, my friends, I never lost stress, got crazy, had anxiety attacks, and looking for my Lord and Savior to run, to be in these positions. It's interesting too because um, about the Andrew Gillum, Someone made a statement about a claim. I believe it is, I can say it's true because it happens a lot, that when he won the primaries, because he had a real clean, smooth campaign, he gave people vision, he ditched most of, he terminated most of the members of his campaign team and brought in hacks to run the general, for the general election. And it reminds me of the late Bill McBride done that in 2002. I had a passing individual that passed away years ago, and he told me about this, and was really highly critical of Bill McBride's decision. So, I call this the Bill McBride syndrome, and it's like Andrew Gillum, except his own bear trap. So even though everyone's worried about him, running be being governor and doing all these corporate tax hikes and this and that. When I told everyone if Amendment Five passes, that's what is a super majority, two third super majority vote on raising taxes on the state level, he would have had a big problem. It did pass. So regardless is in there. It's gonna be harder for them to raise certain taxes on the state level. Which I believe is good. Some people may not like it, but I do say taxation is theft. And the people should make that decision. I do remember the Voles Approval Amendment in 1998, if I'm correct. And uh, even though I wasn't a big, big fan of Jeb Bush, but he supported it. And many of the politicians there were crying like little kids because someone messed their sandbox. Well, that was in, this is now. Well, I'm glad, you know, that got passed. And many of the laws, amendments in that were in there, the bundles I was not pleased with because you support one or against the other, you have to vote one way or the other, which is to me is an entrapment uh, referendums. Many of them were in there. And the victim's rights is a little controversial as well. Two especially when it comes to the right to kitten out and so forth, if it doesn't happen, and the right to protect them, supposedly, it may contradict oh, yeah, yeah, well, Sovereign Immunity yeah. Tort Liability Act, which is Florida Statute 768.28, which I addressed this on my show multiple times. The Greyhound, oh, yeah. it was a dying business anyway, but they say there's ban it. And of course, smoking, vaping, and all that in the, in the businesses. They're going to dictate on the state level on how people should do their business. I believe in freedom of choice. A lot of places I don't go because I don't have to. Even a lot of places heavy smoke. I don't need to go inside. Who's putting the gun in your head to go in these places? That is the question. That's what freedom's about. And even a property, certain property um, amendments that 
will um, dissect some of the basic rights. So it's interesting about if you study the history. So I, I look at I read some of the stuff in there too. But you know what? This is how it is. But my natural born rights will never be taken away. So I want to have some fun. I had some fun this past election. I didn't stress out. Some people I, I supported didn't get in. But it is, uh, I sent a message. Because I don't support established candidates in good faith. And everyone should just start doing their homework a little more. Because, um, and read the fine print. But it's happening little by little. But more people, I encourage, to do your homework. You got the internet, utilize it. You'd be surprised what you can do. So I'm going to probably check on who won the local level and some of the house positions in Florida. One senator I'm not crazy about ran unopposed. So he'll be getting some correspondences from me when that time comes. Because he voted yes on SB 7026, which a lot of is very, a lot of great point about school safety, but when it came to purchasing rifles at eight to eight, from 18 to 21 and 3D William Pierre on the state level, it has to be voted on. That particular language has to be voted on by the people of Florida, not through legislation. It's uncon that area, that language is unconstitutional, null and void. And even the so-called red flag uh, um, um, rule too violates due process. Yeah, so that's a tyrannical sympathizer. Many of them in there, regardless if they're Democrat and Republican. That includes flip flopper Scott. There's a recount for him, the recount, which Bill Nelson requested. So everyone should hold hands and sing God bless the Patriot Act when Bill Nelson leaves in shame. There's too many freedom haters out there, my friends. We all got to put their, our, their feet to the fire. You well, never trust them, regardless if you praise these individuals or not. And that's how I look at things. Observe and stay vigilant. On a federal level, they say many of the Democrats have the House. One of the things they could do, they, they could hold the purse under Article 7, 1, Section 7 of the U.S. Constitution. But we got the 10th Amendment, too. They're going to try to climax. Oh, let's, let's do subpoenas on Donald Trump. We can impeach him. We'll all be free. Please. If you folks are going to buy that, then you're being duped. That's all I gotta say. Enough of my digression on this matter. Alright, so I'm not gonna be talking anything about the elections. However, this is came, I just got this from Doug Owen from blacklistednews.com, which he hasn't been shadow banned on Twitter. And, um,. It's a good site called Mint Press News, and they're and it's um, donate with no money to them and all that, and they're very uh, very open. This is mainly about the boycott, divestment, sanctions, and it's by Whitney Webb. Leaked documentary documentary shows Israel lobby used fake sexual assault claims against BDS activists. And some pro-Israel activists have twisted efforts to give sexual assault survivors stronger voices by using fake harassment claims as ammo in their fight against Palestinian solidarity activists. And it was funny about the BDS bills and laws on the state and federal level. Senator Ted Deutsch claims he supports free speech, but if you support the BDS, you're being anti-Semitic. And this clown is back in pop one, his position. And I'm trying to figure that one out. Oh, yeah, I like Ted Deutsch. He's a Democrat, but he hates the Bill of Rights. That's okay. Game of exceptionalism. And even in the Florida state, Florida state, state of Florida, the, the idiots in um, legislation voted for it as well. And Flip Flop Brooks Scott signed it. So another freedom-hating sap. 
birds of a feather flock together, my friends. This is why you got to pay attention. So it all came out today. Whitney Webb has, has, has reads here. As it reads, Washington, D.C., of course, a leak Al Jazeera documentary detailing the tactics of the Israeli lobby in the United States and elsewhere has revealed that pro-Israel groups regularly invented smears, including false accusations of sexual assault, to discredit professors and students on U.S. university campuses that support equal rights for Palestinians and the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement. BDS is a nonviolent movement that seeks to use economic pressure to, on Israel's government so that it complies with international law, ends the military occupation of the West Bank, and halts the decades-long blockade of the Gaza Strip. In the third episode of the Al Jazeera documentary, The Lobby, which was a leaked online by website Electra Intifada, focus is given to the effort of the pro-Israel advocacy groups on U.S. Universities, particularly the efforts of these groups to use aggressive information warfare tactics to discredit and smear activists. The documentary further reveals that these smear campaigns are incredibly fully funded to the tunes of millions of dollars and involved in coordination with the Israeli government, Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Can we say foreign aid, $3 billion a year the United States sends to Israel can be used in this matter? In one instance, Bill Mullen, a professor of American studies at Purdue University and a well-known supporter of Palestinian rights and BDS, was accused of sexual harassment in supporting terrorism and other deeds by nearly two dozen anonymous web pages purporting to have been created by Mullen's former students in 2016. Mullen told Al Jazeera that within 48 hours of learning of the smear ties, he discovered that he had been created within moments of each other and appeared to be operated by the same individual or group. As the websites used the name of his daughter were to anonymously sent to his wife, Mullen told Al Jazeera that these people will do anything, they are capable of doing anything to discredit pro-Palestinian solidarity activists. This documentary further revealed that this tactic is promoted by pro-Israel campus organizations, including the Israel on Campus Coalition. For instance, ICC Executive Director Jacob Bain discussed how the anti-Israel people are targeted by groups like the ICC who put up some anonymous websites and targeted Facebook ads that make false sexual harassment claims and other personal attacks as part of an effort to discredit them and their activism. And you can see the episode here of the lobby. Bames then stated that this tactic is a form of psychological warfare that was modeled on General Stanley's McChrystal's counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq and those and that those tactics who have been working really well really well for us. Bame appears to have misspoken given that McChrystal's strategy emphasizing offensive information operations was focused on Afghanistan, not Iraq. However, Bame recounted that these efforts are often very successful from his perspective, telling Al Jazeera undercover reporter that the activists targeted by smears either shut down or they spend time responding to it and investigating it, which is time they can't spend can't spend attacking Israel. Bame, Bame, Bame went on to the step, state that ICC, which works closely with other pro-Israel university groups like Stand With Us, has a budget of $2 million for research used in smear campaigns. He further admitted that this group and the affiliates coordinate with Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which employs a large number of former agents of the Mossad. Right off of uh, everybody's playbook propaganda, right? The recently leaked episode of Lobby documentary shows that some pro-Israel activists have twisted efforts to give sexual assault survivors stronger voices by using fake harassment claims as ammo for the psychological warfare tactics against Palestinian solidarity activists. This use fabricated of sexual harassment smears to target pro-BDS activists threatens the recent high-profile efforts to the Me Too movement and other related activist groups who seek to help promote an environment where the experience of sexual assault survivors are more rarely accepted. There's more of the post post fact world we can say, right? Defamation and libel as a pro propaganda ploy, ploy. In addition to use of falsification of and smears against BDS supporters, the documentary showed evidence that employees and volunteer pro-Israel campus groups were instructed to call BDS a racist hate group and were asked to produce multimedia content such as memes that even their own employees considered to be dishonest and bigoted. Sounds like Ted Deutsch was writing his letter about BDS, right? 
I want to ask some to criticize Israel, please. I don't know when John Lewis became sem Semites, do you? An employee of the Israel Project who was featured in the documentary, Amanda Botfeld, told Al Jazeera's reporter, undercover reporter, that much of pro-Israel advocacy works. She had been asked to be made her feel uneasy and uncomfortable because it smeared Palestinian rights activists as any Semites and race for criticizing Israeli government policies. <laughs> also, Palestinians aren't Semites, right? <laughs> They're the only ones, Israeli people, are the only ones who are Semites for thousands of years. Oh, man, that could pee on microphone rhetoric, can you say? Another practice that made um, Botfeld feel uncomfortable was the creation of multimedia content for Stand With Us that featured pictures of Palestinian kids with a knife and other images that were used to paint young Palestinians that had been killed by Israeli police and soldiers as terrorists. Botfeld uh, opened that content when he... She was asked to make while working with the Israel, Israel Project was bigoted, and she was embarrassed to be associated with. Botfield also said that one of her supervisors told her to insert the word racist in reference to BDS activism as often as possible. The fact that even employees of these pro Israel groups are so acutely aware of the biased, bigoted nature of their response to the growth of the BDS movement underscores how these tactics are used to discourage and chill the atmosphere of debate by malign and defaming activists and their message. It's interesting about that because um, you're always going to find people, if you criticize their government, they want to use that same category as being anti-Semitic. It's nothing more than a deception, a lie, rhetorical toilet paper, I would say. Hot air. See, something like this, a boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, it's called freedom of speech in the United States. And many of these clowns are trying to say that it's anti-Semitic. That's a bald-faced lie. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going around hating the Israeli people as a whole, but like every form of government, they have their criminal elements or rogue entities or agents that can manipulate everybody and they can get away with it. A form of tyranny, to be exact. And I don't know, I'm very damn convinced that the Jewish people in that nation want to live in peace with their brothers and sisters that are in the Palestinians. Remember, many, many of these Palestinians too are Jewish as well. Jewish by faith. All right, they're not all white, all white, paled and there are many complexions to have the same belief system. So how's that being anti-Semitic? It's n irrelevant, to be exact. And when you got these folks going to these colleges and trying to smear them, back make it backfire. You got to ridicule those individuals that want to use the fear tactic. The more you know, the more you implement, the less you fear. And even right off of Edward Bernays' propaganda playbook, Manipulate public relations. Sun Tzu, The Art of War. And many other books out there you should, folks need to look at. How to counter these Charltons. And I remember I did share stuff about the video No Guns for Jews. How Palestine, Palestine wanted to disarm the Jews in 1945 saying we will protect you. You know who ran Palestine at the time? Who was Britain. And that's one of the main reasons why I just took the cake on the down to earth point of view. That thing's very complex but I can give you that aspect of world which I condemned. And many people here on my show understand that. Fight the slander. Put out the truth. Even to these uh, protesters when you're going to go out there have merit. Don't just go in there for kicks. An informed activist is a is a threat to the adversaries or opposition. Cool. So I'm gonna do the next one here, and um, came from Middle East Monitor. Eris Snowden Saudi. Eris Snowden Saudi used Israel spyware to target Khashoggi. And that's what he had to say. U.S. whistleblower 
It was snow, snowed in yesterday, claimed that Saudi Arabia used Israeli spy word to target murdered Saudi, Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Addressing the conference in a Tel Aviv in a via, via video link, Snowden claimed that software made by an Israeli cyber intelligence firm was used by Saudi Arabia to track and target Khashoggi in the, in the lead up to his murder on the 2nd of October inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Snowden told his audience, how do they, Saudi Arabia, know what his Khashoggi plans were and that they need to act against him? This knowledge came from technology developed by NSO, Israeli Business Daily Globe reported. Snowden accused NSO of selling a digital burglary tool, adding it's not just being used for catching criminals and stopping terrorist attacks, not just for saving lives, but for making money. Such levels of recklessness actually starts costing lives, according to Jerusalem Post. Snowden made infamous in 2013 for leaking classified national security agency files and exposing the ex extent of the U.S. surveillance added that Israel is routinely at the top of the U.S classified threat list of hackers along with Russia and China, even though this is an, this is an ally. Snowden is wanted in the, US, in the U.S. for espionage and could not travel to Tel Aviv to address the conference in person uh, for fear of being handed over to the authorities. Israel firms to which Snowden referred NSO Group Technologies is known for developing the Pegasus software, which can be used to remotely infect a target mobile phone and then relay, relay back data accessed by this device. Although NSO claims that this product are licensed only to legitimate government agency for the sole purpose of investigating and preventing crime and terror, it is not the first time its Pegasus software has been used by Saudi Arabia to track critics. In October, it's revealed that Saudi Arabia used Pegasus software to eavesdrop on a 27-year-old Saudi descent, dissident Omar Abdullah's, Abdullah's, a prominent critic of the Saudi government on social media. The, re the revelation was made by Canadian research group Citizen Lab, which found that the software had been used to hack Abdullah's iPhone between June and August of this year. Citizen's uh, Lab director Robert Diber explained that such actions by Saudi Arabia would cons constitute illegal wiretapping. A separate report by Citizen Lab in September found a significant expansion of Pegasus usage in the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC, countries in the Middle East, and particularly the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. Citizen Lab added that in August 2016, Emirati human rights activist Ahmad Mansour was targeted with the Pegasus spyware. So his comments come um, come less than a week after it emerged to the uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asked the United States to stand by the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman MBS in the wake of the Khashoggi case. The revelation was made by the Washington Post which cited information from U.S. officials familiar with the series of telephone conversations made to Jared Kirshner, senior advisor to the President Donald Trump and Trump's son-in-law, also National Security Advisor John Bolton, regarding the Kahagi case. Officials told the Post that in recent days, the Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu have reached out to Trump administration to express support for the Crown Prince, arguing that he is an important strategic partner in the region, said people familiar with the calls. Can we say Israel, the Israeli um, the Greater Israeli Project, the Greater Israel Project, excuse me. Ben Salman has come under intense scrutiny in the months since Khashoggi first disappeared, with many suspecting his involvement in ordering the Bureau of murder, murder. Yet, while several other world leaders have shunned the Crown Prince, it is thought that Israel would suffer from, from any decline in Saudi Arabia in the region in the light of its purportedly central role in the upcoming deal of the century. It's interesting there. So it's a nice little claim about they using spy. Remember, they're all part of the New World Order family. Okay, these rogue elements within these particular countries. Not no, I'm not surprised at all. It's a one big cloak and dagger game, folks. That's why I'm not surprised if it's been used or not. And even me, even too, is about Kashagi was involved. Had family ties with the CIA. I talked about that in my past episodes. It looks like one thing he did, he may have ticked somebody off. So, 
I wouldn't be surprised one bit. Remember, friends, government is not your friend. All right, next one here. Bob Livingston came out today. The truth about Social Security. Another most important election in our lifetime has come and gone. I've seen many of them over the years, and all of them have something in common. Politicians using Social Security to scare the people. Yeah, no problem, my bad. There is no different with Democrats claim that Republicans are going to cut Social Security. Retired people are very concerned about what the government will do to Social Security payments. The politicians love to use Social Security to get in office and stay in office. What is the real truth about Social Security? I'm going to tell you something you probably never heard and never will hear if you listen only to politicians and the mainstream propaganda media, what they call the garbage stations, of course. There are three sides of Social Security. They are the government, those who pay in producers, and those who receive payment, consumers. All three have a different perspective and different goals. First, let's start with the government. The U.S. government has a serious problem with Social Security. And I hasten to add that the problem is not funding Social Security. Social Security is not funded. It has no trust fund. It will never be funded. Government payments to Social Security recipients are no different from government payments for anything else. The government simply sends computer symbols to your checking account, then spend numbers by writing them on a paper check or swiping debit card and passing them to somebody else. If you don't have any money, only imaginary numbers called money. Just about any about anybody you talk to is worried that Social Security will go broke. Let's settle this nonsense once and for all. There are, the only possible way to go broke is to have substance as money, such as silver and gold, and spend it all with no way to get any more. We must we just agree that money is only numbers which represent absolutely nothing. How can the government run out of numbers? They can create numbers until the end of time. So, what is the serious problem that the government has with Social Security? Government is concerned with the exponential growth of the retirement population. Our economic system will collapse if our population gets too heavy with non-producing consumers. To take my word for it. So much consumption can be allowed by non-producing, consuming, retired people. Modern governors are very sensitive about consumption. The reason behind it is simple. Government is the biggest consumer of all. In some poverty-stricken third world countries, government have already consumed all the national wealth. So there is no one left to produce and no one to buy if anything is produced. The bottom line is that government will not, under any circumstance, let the social security system out consume the government and the productive capacity of the country. Production must balance consumption since only so much can be produced then it allows that only such can be consumed. Consumptions must be regulated and that is the problem. What will the government do? The government law long ago started taxing social security. What does taxing do? Well, the American people believe that their taxes support the government, and this is absolutely not true. Taxes of any kind have nothing to do with supporting the federal government. The federal government creates money through the central bank, a.k.a. the Federal Reserve. Yeah, we'll continue on here. Remember the numbers we discussed above. Taxing is very important because it is the process of taking some of the numbers back. Total control consumption when the government taxes your income or Social Security is cutting your consumption. The more government taxes, the more it reduces consumption. The more the government consumes, the less it will allow people to consume. So government consumption goes up and your taxes go up to cut more of your consumption. Yes, punish you for making a living. Remember, there cannot be more consumption than production, and the government is certainly not going to cut its consumption. If anything, it will just increase. So you can expect the government will tax Social Security more and more. You will hear political rumbling about taking Social Security away from the people who can afford to do without it. Also known as political parlance as the rich. Discrimination will be expanded. Next, those more fortunate who have to make an extra effort in life will be taxed more or deny altogether what they paid in. Consumption by the retired population will be cut and cut massively. 
government will do what it has always done. It will engage in class warfare. It will play the have-nots against the haves. Those who have worked hard and saved, if you understand the philosophy of government and if you understand the economic system, what we just said is easy to predict and you can count on it. The cuts will come outright or through self-advocated national emergency and in other devious ways. But they will become as a monstrous government consumes the national wealth. And it will come regardless of whether your politician is a D or an R. Another way of security consumption will be cut by raising the age for the people to become eligible for social security as is already being done. When social security began, people could receive benefits at age 65. But in 1985, when social security was created, the average life expectancy was 60 years for men and 64 for women. This means far more people were paying in producing that they, than they were receiving benefits consuming. Many producers never saw a dime of their money. This is what government prefers because it allows it to consume more. The sucking sound. Metal life expectancy is 76 for men and 81 for women. So consumption is beginning to far outpace production, creating the age at which benefits are available, forces to produce the producers longer as and delays their ability to retire and become consumers. <laughs> Train came by, of course. Social security crisis has absolutely nothing to do with funding from the government and the politicians' viewpoint. The problem is how to reverse consumption from the fast-growing, non-producing consuming people who get social security. Also, the welfare medical system not consuming far more than it will be allowed in the future. The propaganda mills are already grinding about waste and inefficiency in the medical industry and laws will be passed to cut Medicare and restrict treatment opinion options. Retired people will have to pay more and more for their medical expenses and some will become unavailable based on age and health status death panels. Anytime the government and politicians regulate your consumption with new income taxes or social security taxes, their purpose is to increase government consumption. It doesn't matter which politicians are in power. It's a philosophy and the plan of modern governments that create money through central banks. Uh-huh. Karl Marx would be extremely proud because central banking he supported under the Communist Manifesto. That's right, my friends, so stop pointing the finger and crash right through that paradigm wall. Again and again and again, government is never your friend. I know I've beaten a dead horse, but you know what? It has to be addressed. Because everyone wants to follow the hype, the hoopla. The political manifestation. Look at the last elections. Look at this one place up the road. They want to gill them. I see a big gill them crowd. Looking for the Lord and Savior. I kept, I, I kept pretty quiet. I just went, hey, the battle of the established candidates is here. The final, the final day. Well, as I recall, reading about the 1935 Social Security Act after the United States was under receivership was officially bankrupt, they said Social Security is an option. Now they just weasel the way in. To make it quote unquote mandatory. Okay, folks, think about it. How's that being free? Something to look at. This is why I'm I always gotta vary. Never leave all your security security financial eggs in one basket. Uh, I know that. So it's one of those things, my friend. One of those things. All right, next one here, which is pretty good news. I like this one a lot. Came out yesterday by Mike Meharry. New Hampshire Privacy Amendment passes by huge margin. An individual's right to live free from governmental intrusion is private or personal information is natural, essential, and inherited. And it's funny, you got 8% voted yes and 20% voted no. So the part of ones who vote no while on their hands and knees and go state I will bend over to get more respect. I want that promotion. I will do anything necessary. And I will continue on here. Today, New Hampshire voters said yes to privacy by a huge margin and set the stage to undermine the federal, federal surveillance state. The passage of Question 2 said a constitutional foundation to protect privacy rights 
in New Hampshire by adding the following language to Article 2 of the New Hampshire State Constitution. An individual's right to live free from governmental intrusion and private or personal information is natural, essential, and inherited. Tic-tac-toe. At the time of publication, question 2 passed by 80 to 20 vote, with 43% reporting. Path to the ballot, legislation action earlier this year placed Q2 on the ballot. Re um, Representative Neil Kirk, Republican from Rear, W-E-A-R-E, -E, and Representative Robert Cushing, Democrat from Hampton, introduced House Constitutional Amendment 16 in January. The legislation passed the House by 235 to 96 and cleared the Senate 15 to 9. Look at that. You can still have your differences and have common interests. New protections. Addition to this, of this language, the New Hampshire Bill of Rights bars the state from infringing on an individual's right to privacy and creates a legal framework to protection personal information, including digital data. On the prime eyes of the government, passage of the amendment establishes a right of privacy as a default setting in the state of New Hampshire. As the ACLU pointed out in an article supporting the amendment, without protection explicit, explicitly, Enshrined in the state constitution, the right of privacy in New Hampshire exists at the whims of the state legislators. Without state constitutional without state constitutional protections, privacy is not a granted state's default setting. Rather, it deals to be repeatedly established, protected, and defended by the state legislature each time a new surveillance technology or method is established, which is a common occurrence in our modern technological world. State legislators should not play an endless, a wacky mole against the rest to their resident privacy. Rel relying exclusively on piecemeal statutes or search and seizure provisions written before the dawn of the internet is no way for the New Hampshire to protect privacy. Prior to Q Q2, passing Q2, individuals in New Hampshire have no state constitutional foundation to argue against state and local government surveillance. They were forced to rely on protections, written statutes that legislators can change on a whim. Passage Q2 create a legal constitutional basis to challenge state surveillance. According to the ACLU, it will require that the government obtain a judicial warrant supported by a probable cause before accessing any personal information. It will, uh, <clears throat> it will also set the foundation to help prevent law enforcement from accessing private information through third parties. But simply adapting Q2 will fill important gaps in current statutory privacy protections and will provide automatic, automatic privacy protections regardless of what the next wave of surveillance technologies and technology brings. But they can be more consistent with the New Hampshire's legacy of cherishing individual liberty. This is fantastic. I love it. Live free or die, not live free or wine, all right? The next uh, passage of Q2 creates a foundation to limit states and local st uh, surveillance and minimize the amount of personal information and collected and stored by state and local governments. By doing so, it also would impact federal surveillance programs that depend on the state and, and, and support and local support. Information collected by law, local law enforcement undoubtedly ends of the federal database. The feds can share and tap into vast amounts of information gathered at the state and local level through the system known as the Information Sharing Environment, or ISE. In other words, local data collection using AP, ALPR stingrays and other technologies created that the potential for the federal government to attract the movement of millions of Americans and obtain and store information on millions of Americans, including phone calls, emails, web browsing, history, and text messages with, no, with all with no warrant, no probable cause, and without people even knowing it. According to its website, the ISE provides analysts, operators, and investigators with information needed to enhance national security. These analysts, operators, and investigators have missions, needs to collaborate and share information with each other and with private sector partners and our foreign allies. In other words, ISC serves as a conduit for sharing of information gathered without a warrant. The federal government encourages and funds surveillance technology, including AR, ALPRs, drones, and stingrays as is at the state and, and local level across the U.S. In return, it undoubtedly gains access to a massive data pool on Americans without having to expand the resources to collect information itself. By requiring approval and a place in the acquisition of spy gear in the public spotlight, local governments can take the first step toward limiting the surveillance state at both local and national level. 
In a nutshell, without state and local assistance, the feds have much more difficult time gathering information. When the state limits surveillance and data collection, it means less information the feds can tap into. The this representative major blow to the surveillance state and a win for privacy. I think this is awesome, and I'm very pleased to hear about this because, um, like I said, my friends, a lot of stuff is going crazy, a lot of hectic on the federal level, but a lot of great things are happening on the state level. So, um, this is awesome, and hey, that's how that's how you do things, my friend. If there's a if it's a problem, they try to pass some federal referendum which is unconstitutional you can nullify it on the state level so excellent all hail to the granite state new hampshire and this one here came from um yesterday as well with mike meharry once again gun rights sanctuary counties voters in oregon self set foundation for eight oregon voters say yes to set foundation to create eight and this is in douglas county Voters in Oregon counties and eight Oregon counties have passed ballot measures that set the stage to create what call is called gun rights sanctuary counties. Second Amendment preservation ordinances on the ballot passed on in eight or ten counties today. They had they created a mechanism to guarantee that no county funds will be used to enforce gun laws that they are believed to violate the Second Amendment, including registration rules and limitations on semi-automatic weapons and ammunition, according to a report in the new new. News review of Douglas County. Voters there passed a measure 10 165 by an overwhelming margin of 73, 73 to 27. It would require the sheriff to determine whether any federal, state, or local law regulations relating to firearms, firearm accessories, or, or ammunition violate the U.S. or Oregon Constitution. Any law or regulation the sheriff de deem unconstitutional would be enforceable in the county. Only deemed unconstitutional, the ordinance would prohibit the county from authorizing the use of funds, resources, employees, agencies, contractors, buildings, detention centers, or offices for the purpose of enforcing such laws. Some of the Second Amendment preservation ordinances passed in the following counties as well. Baker, Me Baker Measure 1-846-34%. Columbus Measure 5, which is 270 52 to 48. Call math measure 18-110 63 to 37 That's all percentage here Lake measure 19-32 72 to 28 Lynn measure 22-174 50 to 49 Umatilla measure 30-128 65 to 35 Union measure 31-96 58 to 42% Jackson County residents rejected Measure 15-181, 43 to 57%, and, L and Lincoln County rejected Measure 21-289 by a vote of 36 to 64%. So they want to say, come on, state, we'll bend over. We, we like, we love our governor. <laughs> oh, good grief. Rob Taylor is an Oregon activist who was an instrumental spearhead in the movement to get these ordinances on the ballot. So he wants to see every county in the state adopt similar ordinances. Every time that I file an initiative, there are feelings of excitement, anticipation, and readiness and eagerness to begin the campaign. It is so empowering to live in the country where the founders had such foresight to create a process an individual can use to redress their grievance against the government machine, he said. Politics can be prelude to war or a solution to an overwhelming conflict. The initiative process is a check on unfettered authority in another way to defeat those who would take away individual rights without people resorting to real weaponry on real battlefields. However, he, we will ye wield these initiative petitions like weapons against the state and federal governments that are intent or taken away our right to, the right to bear arms. They will receive no cooperation. The Second Amendment sanctuary ordinance will be our hammer to pound against opponents and shield to protect supporters until have created a sanctuary state for all law-abiding gun owners in every county of Oregon. According to Taylor, shares in eight or of the ten counties publicly support Second Amendment preservation ordinances. Only one has opposed the measure. Lincoln County Sheriff Curtis Landers signed into onto a statement of opposition. That was littered with fallacies, including an invocation of the Federal Supremacy Clause. So he won those guys. Hi, I'm Sheriff Curtis Landers. When they say bend over, I go, how far, please? Congratulations. So people in that county should know what to do. If there's a recall, do it. 
if you're going to toss the re his rear end out one way or the other. I will, con I will proceed. Legal basis. Second Amendment uh, preservation ordinances rest on well-established legal principle known as the anti commandeering doctrine. To be put, the federal government cannot force states to, to help implement or enforce any federal act or program. That includes enforcing federal firearm laws. The anti commandeering doctrine is based primarily on five Supreme Court cases dating back to 1842. Prince versus the United States serves as a cornerstone, which happened in 1997. That was the Brady Law, which Judge Rowe was involved with. We held in court, we held in New York that Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce federal programs. Today, we, we hold that Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by conscripting the states, others directly. The federal government may neither issue di directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the states, officers, or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. It matters not where the policy makings evolve, and no case by case weighing other burden or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incap incompatible with our constitutional principle of dual sovereignty. Something like that you read from Federalist, Federalist Papers 46, written by um, James Madison. So this is um, very good stuff here. And more recently, in Murphy versus NCAA 2018, the court held that Congress cannot take any action that dictates what state legislation may or may not do. Even when, when the state action conflicts with federal law, Samuel Alto, Alto wrote, a more direct affront to state sovereignty is not easy to imagine. He continued, the anti commandeering doctrine may sound arcane, but it's simply the expression of a fundamental structural decision incorporated into the Constitution, i.e. the decision to withhold from Congress the, the powers to issue orders directly to the states, conspicuously absent from the list of powers given to the Congress, is the power to issue direct orders to the governments of the states. The anti commandeering doctrine simply represents recognition of this limit on congressional authority. Effective, the federal government relies heavily on state cooperation to implement and enforce almost all of its laws. Some um, re regulations and art, including gun control, by simply withdrawing this necessary cover operation, states and local localities can nullify and affect many federal actions, as noted at, by the National Governors Association during their partial government shutdown of 2013. States are partners with the federal government on most federal programs. Based on James Madison's advice to the states and individuals in Federal Six, federal six Papers 46, a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union represents an extremely effective method to bring down government gun control measures because enforcement action relies on help, support, and leadership from the state and local governments. So you can refuse the officers of the union. Fox News senior judicial anal analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano agreed. In a televised discussion on the issue, he noted that a single state taking this step will make federal gun laws nearly impossible to enforce. Partnership don't work too well when half the team quits, said Michael Bolden of the 10th Amendment Center. By withdrawing all resources and participation, federal gun control, state, and even local governments can bring these unconstitutional acts to their much-needed end. Some gun rights supporters argue that this measure is unnecessary because it addresses a non-existent problem with the Republican Congress and the NRA-backed president. In fact, the Trump administration actually re ramped up enforcement of federal gun laws in 2017. So, this is why you cannot rely on these lobbyist groups, my friends. You gotta do things on different levels, like what they've done in these particular counties in Oregon, which is fantastic. That's how you do it. Tenth Amendment, Federal Six uh, Papers 46, any commandeering doctrine. I find it really awesome. So, um, and people got people got look at look at everything. There's nothing nothing can't be done. If you say it can't be done, you won't let it happen. Don't be those people standing around doing nothing. I remember I put a post on about that about voting. I said, oh, everyone's going to do nothing. Well, I do a lot of stuff. I don't beat my head and vote and sit there and be dumb, stagnant, and happy. Well, that's how you got to see things. You got to be a little bit more proactive in your own avenues. 
But you know what? Thumbs up to the folks in those areas in Oregon. And that one sheriff that bends over for the state, he is nothing more than a declaration of Uncle Tom. And I say that ethically. Ooh, okay. Here's one more here. This actually came from the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. It came out the 5th. And he made a commentary here. Censorship and gun control will not make us safe. Sadly, but not unexpectedly, the mass shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh is being used to justify new infringements on liberty. Of course, opponents of gun rights are claiming that claiming this shooting proves America needs more gun control. Even some who normally oppose the gun control that the government needs more to do to keep guns out of the hands of the, quote, mentally ill, unquote. Those making this argument ignore the lack of evidence that background checks new restrictions on, on the rights of those alleged to have mental illness or any other form of gun control would have prevented the shooter from attaining the firearm. Others are using the shooter's um, history of posting anti-Semitic comments on social media to call an increase in efforts by both government and social media to websites to suppress hate speech. The shooter posted anti-Semitic statements on the social media site Gab. Gab, unlike Twitter and Facebook, does not block or ban users for offensive comments. After the shooting, Gab was suspended by his internet service provider, and PayPal has closed the site's account. This is an effort to make social media websites responsible for the content, even the actions of, of their users, turning the site's operators into thought police. See, third-party blame game. It's like the frivolous laws through some firearm companies that someone is responsible for having firearm and shooting, somebody, shooting a bunch of people on a shooting spree through the gun, the gun, the, the gun manufacturer. Some social media sites, particularly Facebook and Twitter, are eagerly to silence not just bigots, but those using their platforms to advocate for liberty. Facebook has recently banned a number of libertarian pages, including Cop Block, a site opposing police misconduct. Twitter also has also banned a number of conservatives and libertarians, as well as critics of American foreign policy. Some libertarians say they should not get upset that these private companies excite private property rights. However, these companies are working with government and government-funded entities such as the Atlantic Council, a group funded by NATO and the military-industrial complex to determine who should and should not be banned. The effort to silence hate speech is not just about outlawing racist, sexist, or anti-Semitic speech. The real goal is to discredit, even criminalize, criticism of the welfare warfare state by redefining such criticism as hate. This is not just progressive who wish to use laws outlawing hate speech to silence political opponents. Some neoconservatives want to criminalize criticism of Israel and the non sensual reason that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Other right-wing authoritarians wish to expand hate crime laws to include crimes committed against police officers. Ironically, neoconservatives and other right-wing authorities are among the biggest purveyors of real hate speech. What could possibly be more hateful than speech advocating perpetual war? Cultural Marxists are also guilty of hate speech with their call for both government and private violence against political opponents and for the use of government force to redistribute property. Just about, about the only individuals advocating a political philosophy not based on hate are those libertarians who consistently advance the non-aggression principle. Preserving the right to free speech is vital to preserving liberty. And the value freedom should fight efforts to, uh, to outlaw hate speech. Hate speech may initially be used to target bigoted and other truly hateful speech, but eventually they will be used to silence all critics of the welfare warfare state with the authoritarian philosophies that justify opponent government. To paraphrase Ludwig von Mises, libertarians must fight hate speech include hate speech emanating from Washington, D.C. with the ideas of mind, of the mind. And he's absolutely correct. It's a witch hunting game, okay? Great example, look what happened with suspect shooting Nicholas Cruz. It's considered not effective. That didn't stop him. The laws didn't make anything happen. Did not prevent the shootings that happened at Stoneman Douglas. And the Yahoo politicians in my county, even the city on the city of Fort Lauderdale, want to get rid of the gun shows, common sense gun laws. You see, you see, you see what's going on, folks? It's a domino effect. The road to tyranny. They say freedom's responsible for this, which is nothing more than a rhetorical deception. 
call out these peasants in power, supposedly, they think they're in power. Because they're attorneys, they know more. If they have this mindset, they suck at what they do. That's all I gotta say. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share us with social media networks. If you've got any questions, comments, or you know, send me something that's interesting, man, or check out, whatever you do, please feel free to correspond with me through with the quorum. I will link all my social media sites and email addresses on my speaker page and beyond. All right, my friends. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is something for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading love. And may your guardian spirits be with you.